Great. Can you hear me in the back? I have no hearing in my right ear, so I'm like speaking. I can't hear myself speak. So if I'm not loud enough, somebody please speak up and let me know. And by the way, one other uh, request. I, I know you may have questions all at the end, but at any time throughout the evening uh, of uh, our panelists uh, speaking, if you have a question, just yell out and uh, we'll, we'll have to uh, answer your question. Okay. So I am uh, uh, with a company called CubeSmart, which is a publicly traded company on the New York Stock Exchange. Uh, we own and manage over 900 self-storage lo locations across the country in 29 states. Um, we're a little bit north of a $6 billion market cap company. Uh, unlike a lot of other routes, what makes us a little bit different is the number of full-time equivalents we have. We have nearly 2,500 teammates. Uh, we are a very operationally intensive uh, business. Uh, there's a lot more to self-storage than, uh, than originally meets the eye. Uh, as far as all the real estate product types that, that you would interact with, it seems like the least sexy of them because it's, uh, uh, it is uh, asphalt driveways and roll-up doors. Uh, what's really interesting about the business is unlike the longer-term lease spaces like uh, office, industrial, retail, uh, we have to attract customers into our stores every single day. So we're more of a B2C focus, uh, somewhat like Jim in the, uh, uh, in the, in the apartment business. Uh, if you think about the, the shorter end of the curve of, uh, of real estate lease terms, uh, hotels are the shortest with one day. We're kind of next in line with 30-day leases. And then you get to multifamily with, with typically year-long leases. Uh, so it's a little bit different focus operationally than the longer-term lease companies. Um, a lot of things that we focus on, current trends, are focused on urbanization, uh, how will millennials behave, uh, which is certainly uh, probably of interest in this room. Um, uh, you know, more experiential um, behaviors as consumers, what will that mean for our business 10, 20 years from now? Uh, I, I personally am of the belief that millennials uh, will ultimately behave uh, just as the generation before them, it'll just you, you all do everything 10 or 12 years later than, than everybody else did. But um, from our business, having folks live in small spaces, moving around a lot, uh, and having high household incomes create the best demographics for, for our business. So we focus uh, mostly on the top 40 MSAs with a really specific focus on the top 12. We're the largest owner and operator of stores in the boroughs of Manhattan. We are quite boroughs of New York. Manhattan's our newest borough this year. Yeah. <laughs> Tim, real quick, you want to share with everybody your career path to how you got where you are now? Sure. Uh, I went to Penn State uh, undergrad and moved to this area to join Arthur Anderson um, as an auditor. Quickly gravitated towards real estate clients. Um, was with Arthur Anderson for about four years and was hired away back when you were allowed to do this. Was hired away by one of my clients, Brandywine Realty Trust. Spent. Um, 10 years in various accounting and finance roles at Brandywine before joining CubeSmart uh, almost 11 years ago. Okay. Yep. Yeah, uh, campus apartments is something obviously near to most of your hearts, student housing. You know, we have uh, about 20,000 beds around the country in about 20 different states. Major concentration down in the University of Pennsylvania with a, a mixed bag of, you know, what they call it scattered site urban portfolio, which is townhomes, Victorian houses, brownstones you name it, uh, in that area. Around the country, it's more traditional uh, looking apartment type properties, garden type, garden type apartments. But, um, you know, we have we actually have some on campus, off campus. We really have, you know, pretty much the whole back. And you know, our due diligence mostly is revolves around going in and talking to schools and saying, you know, what do you guys need? Do you need something off campus? Do you want us to work with you and build something on campus for you? Do you want us to use our balance sheet and our financial resources for it? Or would you rather do it, you know, yourselves? We can help you raise the bonds and things like that. And we can kind of do it on a, fee or on a fee basis as well. So we've been doing it for about almost 60 years now. So it's something kind of uh, ingrained in us. We're the oldest student housing operator in the country. But we, you know, have kind of got a pretty good sense of what kids are looking for. You know, and obviously our target market is, you know, you guys. <laughs> um, you know, and I think I, I get the sense that I understand now that millennials are kind of getting out of college. You guys are now, if I've heard you call Generation Z. So I hope there's going to be a better term than that for you guys coming pretty soon. But um, you know, it's really something. Well, our again, our market turns over every the most four years, but it's more really more like two or three years that we have kids in our, our units. So we're you know we have to make sure that we're cutting edge technology wise. You guys are looking for you know Wi-Fi the same way you're looking for running water, and electricity. So we need to make sure that we have those things up to date. 
And it's uh, so you know we operate our own property, we manage our own properties. Uh, as you know, similar to what Tim said, unlike normal multifamily, it's much more labor intensive and much more cyclical. Our leasing cycle happens over three or three month period. I'm sorry, and we turn all of our units uh, pretty much all the same time over two about a two week period in August. So it's uh, pretty complicated, obviously, but it's something that we are really rewarding, and we feel we take it very seriously because our you know, your parents or the other parents of our students are giving us those prized possessions for four years, you know, to watch over. So it's something we we really are, are very very serious about it and, and you know care very much about it. So. Um, we are, you know, we actually have some properties in funds, and we have a property that's been a single investor fund that we've actually just rolled out of in the past year, and we have a lot of stuff that's that's owned uh, by our organization. But we're more of a family-run organization as well. So, as I said, we really kind of run a gamut of, of different kinds of real estate and different kinds of ownership structures as well. So, you know, having talked about any of those kind of things as we go along. Uh, in terms of my my personal experience, uh, you know, I actually also came out of college. I went to Penn, and Started Arthur Anderson as well. You'll kind of hear this theme a few times through this panel, by the way. This is to be a recurring theme, Arthur Anderson. You'll hear a lot, uh, you know. Although none of us had anything to do with Arthur Anderson's problems back <laughs> when they happened, so. Um, but left there, say the same thing as Tim. I also was hired away by one of my clients. It was a real estate communication company in the early 80s. Uh, that was something that happened back then. It was kind of a fad during the 80s. Uh, legislation kind of took that away. So I worked with developers and owner operators since then. So I've been in real estate now for about 35 years. Real quick, just uh, maybe you could share with all of us the typical uh, dorm that you're, if you have a template one uh, for everybody, I know when we went to school it was a bunk bed and two desks and a shower down the hall. So it's a little bit different now, but yeah. does it matter what area of the country you're in or? It kind of does, and yeah, you know, a lot of, a lot of stuff, obviously you guys have heard about, you know, some of the Class A stuff uh, that, we're, that, we're, that we build and we manage. And a lot of other people building as well, you know, with pools and the you know, country club style living, the, the clubhouse, the game rooms, computer labs, all those kind of things. We have a lot of those kind of things around the country. Here in the Northeast, that, that concept still hasn't quite caught on yet, although it's starting to. We're actually opening a property next year that will have, uh, it's small, it's only have 100 beds in it, but it'll also have 100 bathrooms in it because each bedroom now has to have a bathroom. That's one of the, you know, the, the very basic things that, that are, you know, part of our property product anymore, you know, this industry. It's what they call bedroom bathroom paradigm. It's actually even a buzzword for it now. So, um, you know, but you have to make sure that, that you know all your stuff is top notch anymore. Great. Okay. Okay. Well, since I'm in the hospital business, unlike Jim, you are not my target audience. <laughs> 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 um, so uh, 35 years ago, I was sitting uh, out where you are, uh, and I can tell you in a hall that was nowhere near as nice as the one that you roam these days here at Bartley. Um, I graduated in 1982 from Villanova, uh, and I was fortunate enough at that time uh, to come right out of there and heard about this little new startup company out in King of Prussia called Universal Health Services. And what I couldn't understand at the time is, you know, when I was finding out a little bit about the company, uh, you know, people were saying to me, well, they own hospitals. And, you know, I, I couldn't, couldn't, couldn't at that time grasp what that meant because, you know, I always knew hospitals existed, but I didn't think anybody actually ever owned them. I just, you know, figured they were part of uh, neighborhoods and cities and, and academic institutions. But uh, kind of in the 70s and, and then into the 80s, for-profit healthcare was really starting to take off. And um, UHS was, uh, you know, on the forefront of that about 40 years ago. And when I started uh, at UHS, currently we're uh, about 325 facilities, and about 300 of those are on the behavioral health side, uh, and 25 of them are on the uh, acute care side. So, you know, you think about a big med surge hospital, that's what those are. Um, we have about $10 billion in annual revenues, uh, and that's split up pretty much half and half between the acutes and the, the behavioral health. So you can see there's you know roughly 10 behavioral health facilities generate the same amount of revenue that an acute care facility would generate. Um, so when I started at UHS, uh, you know right out of college, the uh, you know our annual revenues were maybe two, three hundred million. We owned you know about 15 facilities. And um, you know, since that time, there, there's just been tremendous opportunity that's been created for the people that were there, and fortunately, I was one of them. Uh, currently, we have 81,000 employees uh, across the nation, uh, including the UK and Puerto Rico. 
Um, and we are uh, number 276 on the Fortune 500 list. Um, you, you know, the, the, acute, or the uh, hospital business, as you've probably been reading over uh, really the last couple of years, but primarily this year, uh, there was, you know, all types of uh, legislative movement uh, during the year about potentially repealing and replacing the Affordable Care Act. Uh, you know, the fortunes of hospital companies or even really any other healthcare companies were going up and down with every rumor that was coming out about what the new bills might provide for or might cut and reducing uh, benefits or cutting the individual mandate. Uh, you know, as it turned out, for the most part, we started right back where, where we finished right where we started. Uh, not a whole lot was passed. There's still the talk and threat that that could occur in the future. And, you know, as I'm sure you've been following, I, I think pretty much everyone acknowledges that the ACA has flaws that need to be worked on. Uh, it's kind of an interesting dilemma for the Republican Party, I believe, because they uh, really ran on the premise that they were going to repeal and replace, and I think that, you know, for the most part, about three quarters of our population think that we ought to try to improve what's there as opposed to, you know, necessarily repealing and replacing it. So it's created the dilemma for the uh, politicians that I think, to a degree, has uh, resulted in the stalemate that we're seeing currently. Um, the other notable thing that occurred during the year, uh, just in the insurance industry, is that there were some major uh, mergers that uh, were contemplated uh, about 18 months ago. Anthem was, uh, you know, trying to take over Cigna, and um, uh, Aetna was trying to take over Humana, and the FTC really took long and hard looks at both of those, and sometime during 2017, uh, rejected both of those deals. From a hospital perspective, I think we uh, thought that that was a good thing as far as patients go and, and really access to care at you know, what we uh, you know, believe is a fair price because when you put the, um, those four companies along with the United Healthcare together, you're talking about essentially 40% of the population getting insurance through those groups. So a consolidation of those payers down to three would have been uh, quite a challenge. Um, as uh, Professor Leva said on uh, the UHT side, um, I am the uh, CFO of UHT. And UHT, uh, although the history is not as long as, as with UHSs, uh, they've only been around a little more than 30 years now. Uh, in 1986, we started a, um, a uh, separately traded New York Stock Exchange uh, healthcare REIT, and at the time, a bunch of the UHS uh, hospital facilities were spun off into UHT uh, to really allow UHS to pay down some debt and, and be able to fuel its growth that it then uh, did throughout the 90s and into the 2000s. UHT currently has 68 properties uh, located in 20 states throughout the nation, much smaller uh, scope than UHS, about a billion dollar market cap. UHS is a $10 billion market cap, uh, about 75 million in, in net revenues. Uh, um, on an annual basis. The, uh, of the 68 properties we have, six of them are hospital facilities, uh, and predominantly we uh, have medical office buildings. So, uh, you know, the majority of our uh, properties now are not affiliated with UHS, although UHS uh, acts as advisor to UHT, and there's a handful of us that um, serve dual, dual roles for the two companies. Um, much like every other REIT, I think what uh, the UHS investors look for is really a, a value or is, is a growth stock. So when people buy into uh, healthcare, they're really looking for long-term growth and performance. Uh, with a real estate investment trust, they're looking more for uh, you know current uh, income that's generated by the, the dividend. And uh, UHT uh, currently has about a 3.6% uh, dividend yield, which you know, is, is really just a kind of a function of what people perceive, uh, you know, as some type of relatively safe and secure investment uh, to go along with some, you know, modest growth, which is what UHT's uh, uh, history has really been over our 31 years. Great. Okay. Jackie. Uh, I'm Jackie Boggs. Uh, I, um, it, I'm with FD Fund Administration. I'm the managing partner of the practice. We offer, you can't hear me? Oh, that's normal. <laughs> Sorry. Um, a little closer to the mic. Thanks. 
We offer services for fund administration, that's accounting services, investor relations, support services, and valuation services for our clients. Our clients are primarily real estate, private equity, and also uh, different deals. Uh, doesn't have to be a fund. And we also have um, uh, just um, regular private equity, excuse me. Um, I am a little different than these guys because I'm all, I'm gonna move over. Thank you. I am all back office. Um, a little less glamorous as far as, thank you. A little less glamorous part of the business where we're supporting all the accounting uh, and Because the ours is so glamorous. <laughs> yeah, it is more glamorous. So, um, but we do see a real estate sector for really everything. Um, we have most of our funds are private equity um, opportunity funds. Uh, but any sector, so we have um, we, we have student housing, um, we have storage, so in our, in our clients, and so that our team is doing those valuations. Um, I I'm from Villanova, so I'm also a graduate. I'm uh, uh, I think I'm a supernova. I qualify. Yeah. yeah. So because I have my master's in tax from here, so my first 15 years was tax. And uh, I went in and out of public accounting, uh, always working for real estate. Um, I left for a client as well, and then went back to public accounting, back to EY. Um, then hired back by my uh, employer where I worked for tax, and that's where I first got out of tax and was able to be uh, in the finance side of things. Um, did that for a while until I got bored uh, doing the same thing over and over again, and then I got into private equity. And since I've been in private equity, it's not been boring. So uh, we've been quite busy. Um, our firm is uh, only 30 folks. Um, we find that when we're needed, though, is when there's investors. So. We'll have lots of people uh, who will raise a small fund uh, or even a larger fund, and they're fine doing some accounting or doing their servicing in-house until they have investors that have more stringent needs. And as soon as they have institutional investors, as soon as they have um, um, maybe foreign investors, some kind of reporting that they're unable to do internally, that's when they look to us. Also, on the valuation side, if they're gap, they need to um, value their properties and report that on a regular basis. That's when they're looking for an administrator to help them out. So lots of times um, there's not a need, and you'll see an operator or a developer group raise some funds and they're fine for a little while, and then as soon as they get that institutional money, that's when we sometimes get their book. So, is there anything? No, that's good. Okay, Bob. Okay. Thanks for searching. Uh, Bob McCadden with the Pennsylvania Real Estate Investment Trust. We're actually uh, the second oldest REIT that exists, formed in 1960. Uh, the only one that's older than us is a company in Washington, D.C creatively called Washington Reed. So in the early days, uh, people weren't as creative as using names like CubeSmart to, to find their business. Uh, but for the first mm, 30 years of the company's history, maybe a little bit longer, the company had, was a diversified uh, REIT. And back before, I don't know if you got any of this stuff yet, and, and um, for the Tax Reform Act of 1986, which allowed REITs to become self-managed, previously, they operated like today's um, your real estate private equity funds. In the old days, REITs would go out and find a local development partner. They would provide a capital, but they'd be much more in a passive role. In 1986, Congress passed a law enabled REITs to become uh, self-managed, and that really opened up the doors for a lot of growth in the, in the sector. So from 1960 to 2003, we owned multifamily properties. We owned retail properties. We owned a couple industrial properties. We owned some office properties. Uh, but um, you know, following a series of mergers in 2003, you know, we basically discarded all of the other, uh, disposed all the other property types, and decided to focus exclusively on retail. 
That worked out pretty well for the first uh, so many years following 2003, but the last few years have been you know, quite a challenge for uh, companies that own uh, uh, space that we lease to you know, retail tenants. So right now, we own about 21 properties, uh, depending upon whose valuation metric you want to use, probably a total valuation of somewhere between three and a half and four billion dollars. But in the last five years, we've actually sold uh, 17 malls in primarily secondary and tertiary markets uh, you know, for about eight hundred uh, million dollars, and have really focused our efforts on managing and owning properties in major metro areas. Probably about two thirds of our properties are in the metro Philadelphia area and metro Washington D.C. And what we are seeing, you know, now uh, our strategy is kind of being borne out is that as retailers start to consolidate between the advent of online shopping, which is becoming much more prevalent, as well as um, uh, the fact that there's not a lot of interesting things that retailers are selling today. So you have people gravitating, even if they want to shop in a physical location, they're not finding anything they want to buy, so they're gravitating to online. So what we're finding is that you really need to change the shopping experience of just selling apparel to more of a um, uh, experiential retailing. I think Apple was probably the first uh, well-known experiential retailer. You go to any Apple store, people aren't necessarily buying products, they're in there playing with the products, and eventually when they decide they want to buy something, they buy it there. So if you think about you know, what we're doing today, we're moving away from having an exclusive focus on apparel, which was your typical mall in its heyday, and introducing more dining entertainment. And you know it's still apparel, but it's more fast fashion, the H&Ms of the world, the Zara's, where people are shopping today as well as um, off price. I think shoppers are looking for uh, not necessarily full price merchandise. So we have today about 750,000 square feet of lease assigned that tenants haven't yet taken occupancy. It might be because of we're redeveloping a property, expanding a property, but only about a third of that, those leases that are in our pipeline actually are for traditional full price apparel. Um, you know, in this market very close, the, probably the closest mall that we have here is Plymouth Media Mall, which is at the other end of, uh, you know, Route 476 in North End. And, you know, 10 years ago we opened our uh, Whole Foods as a anchor tenant to the property. Uh, a year ago, actually earlier this year, we opened uh, Lego Lane Discovery Zone, which is kind of a 30,000 square foot, almost amusement park for kids. You go in and there's, you know, rides, kids play with Legos, etc. in there. Okay. <laughs> But it's a fabulous place for uh, to take kids on a rainy day or when you want to get them out of the house. And so we're doing more things like that. We just opened up um, uh, one of these escape room concepts. But you're finding, and you know, probably half a dozen restaurants. So again, the retail, uh, the apparel component of the retail space is becoming smaller and smaller part of our our operation on a global basis. Today, probably at twenty percent of our our GLA, our lease space is dedicated to uh, dining and entertainment and other forms of um, uh, you know, experiential retailing, and that will continue to grow, uh, I think, in the foreseeable future. So some of the mega trends, obviously, are, you know, if you look at Bloomberg today, there was a story about the retail apocalypse. And it wasn't just about you know, Amazon taking market share. It was also about, uh, in the, coming out of the last recession, a lot of um, traditional uh, retailers were taking private by private equity, and a lot of these retailers were levered up, and uh, in, a, in, a, in an area where there's very thin margins, a lot of these retail apparel businesses operate on pretty thin margins. You're dealing with a heavy debt load. There's not a lot of room for error. So if they see any decline in their sales, top line sales, it puts them under great financial distress. So we've seen a significant amount of bankruptcies over the last um, couple of years, probably even a greater number than we had in the recession you know, 10 years ago. So I think we've been focused on replacing a lot of those, again, traditional tenants with non-traditional tenants. And while we're down, I think, modestly occupancy from a year ago, I think we have a pretty robust pipeline, and we expect our occupancy levels to be back you know, to 2014 uh, levels by the end of next year. So it's, it's a bit of a kind of a dogfight out there, um, you know, scratching and competing for tenants. Another major trend that we're seeing is there's a blurring of, of the lines between um, uh, where retailers want to be. In the past, you'd have tenants who would only operate in a mall setting, tenants who would only operate in a grocery anchored um, center, and tenants that would only operate in an open air center. We're seeing tenants are now looking at the best location, irrespective of the format. So 
You're seeing traditional mall tenants now open in open air centers. You're seeing open air tenants like Dick's Sporting Goods now becoming anchors for enclosed malls. So you see a little bit of a blurring of the lines of, um, of the tenants. So it's, it's interesting times, as they said. Can you share with them a little bit about your center city project? Sure. Um, for those of you who are from the Philadelphia area, if anybody spends any time in the city, uh, we had a, a property that we acquired over about a 10 year period. It's, uh, it used to be called the Gallery. It's between 8th and 11th Street on Market Street, downtown Philadelphia. And it was a property that was developed, I guess, in the 1970s by the Rouse Company out of uh, Baltimore, uh, Maryland. And it was one of the first urban malls in the country. And it, it, in some respects, it was success early on, and then became a, an abject failure because of, of what it was. They basically tried to take a suburban mall and drop it down into an urban area and had no connectivity at all to the street. So uh, we bought we bought some properties from the Rouse Company back in it was, um, 2003, uh, but there was three city blocks that were four distinct pieces of real estate with four different owners. So over the 10-year period, you know, we assembled all the pieces and began a project a couple of years ago, and it's now in full construction with our partner, a company called Maserich out of the Santa Monica, California. They're in the mall business like we are. And uh, we brought them in for both their experience with certain types of developments as well as for their you know, financial wherewithal. And essentially we're taking, it's about 800,000 square feet, called a million square feet of retail space, and basically gutting the mall, which we've largely done, and now we're in the process of rebuilding it, and um, you know we expect to open in the fall of 2018 with a completely new presentation to the to the community. What we've done is, if you were to look at um, the mall well, previously, the first two stories of the building were concrete, so you felt like you could you could be standing outside a prison. You didn't have any idea that you were standing outside a retail center. So we're taking those first two levels and opening it up with glass, so you'll. Walk down Market Street now, you'll feel like you're walking, you know, in New York City or any other city where there's kind of high-profile retail. Um, spending probably in the $350 million uh, range to again physically transform the asset, and uh, we haven't announced kind of a full roster of tenants yet. But again, much like the description of the, the business I described, it's going to be entertainment. We did announce an AMC theater, multiplex theater. It's probably the first uh, multiplex in the city of Philadelphia in decades. Just, if you want to see a movie in downtown Philadelphia, there are very few places to go. Uh, there'll be a, a bunch of restaurants, as well as um, some interesting concepts, food concepts. So any of you are familiar with Italy in New York City, it's a concept very similar to that coming out of Italy. Uh, but it'll be unique to the Philadelphia market. And there'll be flagship retailers. H&M will have a flagship store. Victoria's Secret will have a flagship store. There'll be some outlet tenants. Nike will have an outlet. So it'll be kind of a mix of outlet tenants, full price tenants, restaurants, and entertainment. Bowling alley? Uh, possibly. If you want a bowling alley, yeah, we'll get you one. <laughs> and then just by, uh, by way of background, okay. uh, like many of my uh, peers up here, I also started my career at Arthur Anderson. I spent 23 years at Anderson, um, you know, working in a, both in healthcare and real estate. That's where I first started working with my uh, colleague here, Mr. Boyle. Um, and uh, I, when Anderson went down, they spent a couple of years with KPMG, and then joined my uh, current firm, pre, um, which happened to be a former client. And under the kind of intermediate rules, I had been, um, I was no, not serving the client at the time. I was actually scheduled to rotate back on to the, uh, the account when I took a job as a CFO. So I've been there since uh, 2014. Great. Thank you. Where did you graduate? Oh, I graduated from Temple University. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Yeah. And so yeah. We're, we're one shy because I actually graduated from St. Joe's, so we don't have a LaSalle representative. Oh, because yeah. he's not here today. Yeah. Right. Or Drexel, I guess. Uh, so after I graduated from St. Joe's, I also joined Arthur Anderson. I spent 22 years there corresponding with Mr. McKen for my entire career. But I did not spend any real time in real estate. Um, I was mostly in manufacturing, distribution, clients, etc. Uh, when the firm went down, I was uh, in charge of our accounting outsourcing group. So, like Jackie, I've done, I've done some outsourcing. I had my own thing for three and a half years. Uh, and then I got the opportunity to become the CFO of Specialty Finance REIT. And it was a REIT, but it didn't own any assets. It was, a, it was financial instruments. And uh, you guys 
never saw the movie Big Short, and that's kind of stuff we read in the CBOs. <laughs> that didn't work out so well. It was great for five years, <laughs> and then there were alligators in the swimming pool. Uh, so, you know, I, after that, I was a fun CFO. I've, I've done a lot of stuff. So, for the last almost two years now, I've been CFO of Orleans, JP Orleans Home Builders. Uh, your, the name Orleans should sound familiar. I mean, it's a local company that's 100 years old, other than the fact that back in the financial crisis, it went bankrupt. So Jeffrey Orleans, the JP, uh, JP Orleans, uh, the grandson of the original founder of the company, re hit restart. And he basically, from ground zero, uh, we we're up to about $50 million a year in revenues. And the plan is to probably take this to 150 to 200, not necessarily ever go public or et cetera. But, you know, it's, uh, it's semi-custom homes. Our sweet spot is, uh, Four hundred thousand to eight hundred thousand dollar homes, um, and we are right now centered around Charlotte, North Carolina, and uh, Philadelphia. So there's really two major markets for us where we're currently kind of getting our foundation built and, and growing the company. We only have forty employees across the company, so kind of more like you, Jackie, like the rest of them, like these giants over here. Um, but the forty people supporting the fifty million in revenues, you know. We could, Take that up to 150 to 200 with, by adding another maybe 20 people. It's, it doesn't. It's very scalable because we're really working with the trades. We're working with the, the framers and the electricians and the plumbers and the foundation and the masons and whatnot. So they're all external vendors that we use for our product. We compete with the big guys, the Tolls and the Lenars and the you know, Ryan, etc. Uh, it's community by community, and our sweet spot is probably. The uh, 30 to 100 lot community in and out in three years, and uh, the, uh, the you know the, the model is such that you know, we're still coming out of that the crisis going back uh, eight years, ten years. There's still a need for additional homes based on the, uh, the number of households being created. Uh, the stat here is that between up to by 2050, the U.S. will have another. Uh, 80 or 90 million people, so maybe 400 million people in the U.S. create another 40 million households. So uh, there's plenty of capacity need to be built. Uh, now, the rental market is going to also benefit significantly from that uh, as it's become harder for home buyers. And we also have the demographic of the, uh, the two demographics, so the baby boomers and the millennials kind of driving different pieces. The baby boomers are creating opportunity for the over 65, uh, the over 55 communities housing um, and in a lot of cases, what you have is you've got dedicated communities that are uh, age restricted, but you also have, you know, we're, we're, our largest community right now is out in Malvern, and it's uh, townhouses and, and semis, and as well as single houses. Uh, the towns, in a lot of cases, you've got moved down buyers. I mean, but these townhouses are you know, 600,000 large townhouses, so the moved down buyer, once all the amenities and all the luxuries, there's a $2 million swim club and, and pool. And, connected with the community, um, and yet they also don't want to deal with maintenance and maintenance rate, et cetera. So that demographic is going to continue to create opportunities in, in specific areas, but it's also the greatest uh, creator of, uh, of housing because as they move out of houses, that's the, the resale market becomes a significant competitor uh, for us as builders. Uh, the millennials, as we heard them mentioned a couple of times before, are being the largest you know, working part of the population, are going to eventually uh, not rent and not and start buying houses. And I think do the white picket fence and look for the house in the suburbs and all that stuff. So they will continue to drive us part of the, uh, of the market for us. They've all told us that that's what they want to do when they grow up. We pulled them in class early on. They want to grow up. Well, I still want to grow up too. But no, they said when they do grow Don't up, do it. they want to live in a single family house. A single family yeah. house. Yeah. yeah. And this, you know, and that's okay. that is still kind of the American dream, um, and clearly something we hope continues. Um, so, yeah, you know, I have been to Legoland. I, I have you know, got ten grandkids, eight and under, and we brought five of them, six of them over. Give me a Yeah. Well, I wish I knew. And I wish I knew. Say, he wants to go to Legoland. Poppy <laughs> wants to go to Legoland. <laughs> It's actually, you know, we had been to Disney this year, so it was a little bit of a step back. Ah. I'm not gonna lie. <laughs> so, so price price point on your average home or the range? The range is, you know, we have townhouses that we're we're starting in Eastern New Jersey that will be in the 350 range. Uh, 
uh, we have some singles down in, in Charlotte market, and, and it really is it's driven a lot by the, the school system that you're in to see that it plays a significant role. Because in our Charlotte, we've got five different communities around Charlotte, at pretty much a clock around Charlotte, and the low end ones are, are 275 to 350, whereas we've had another community where we've got multiple million dollar houses. So the million dollar houses are a little bigger, uh, 4,000, 5,000 square feet, but. Uh, it's, it really depends, um, but our sweet spot is probably five, six hundred thousand. Okay. And for our class, I know we haven't talked about the tax act that was just proposed, yeah. but I'd be very interested, and we'll, we will talk about it uh, in the coming classes. But real quick, immediate reaction to what you see there in terms of your... Uh, well, so the, you know, whenever you talk about re eliminating or reducing the interest, the mortgage interest deduction, and I guess what's on the table now is you know, the current limit is that you can have a million dollars worth of principal that you can get deductible <clears throat> interest on, and the proposal is to cut that to a half of a million, 500000 So, you know, somebody buying a $600,000 house is still going to be able to qualify, which are all, the, all their mortgages, probably have a $500,000 mortgage on that house. Whereas when you're buying the million-dollar house, even if you put down 20%, you have an $800,000 mortgage, 300000 of it's not going to you're not going to get an interest deduction for that. Now, you know, is that it's certainly not something that we view as a positive for the housing market, but it depends upon how everything else falls together with the tax rates falling and uh, you know, the state taxes are being eliminated and uh, deductions as well. So um, there seem to be counterintuitive forces though going both right. ways, and I don't, I right. can't figure it out yet. The flip side of that, Ed, is because I'm looking to grow this and uh, looking for uh, passive investors. Okay, so the, react, like the one thing that's happening is that the tax rate for passive investment is dropping to 28 percent, whereas if you're an active investor, you're still going to pay the 40 percent plus individual tax rates. So the other track, the capital is here. Okay, good. Let me press pause for a second. Then you got it. I'm yeah. done. Okay. Any questions so far for anybody, for any of our panelists? Okay. Yes. All right. Good. Just, uh, this is for Bob. So, uh, you know. You mentioned that the retail space is really evolving now because of the pressure that sort of e-commerce puts on this brick and mortar model. Now, with, with, with sort of this new idea of sort of having non-traditional tenants coming through, I mean, how does that change the risk profile of retail for me as a as an investor going forward? If now you're sort of blending the line or blurring the line between what truly is retail, I'm thinking of even Exton Mall, for example, right. that you guys. Uh, own, and I know there's there's health uh, offices that are in there now. So now you're sort of taking risk exposures from you know a separate sector, maybe in the real estate space, and now it's one into retail. Do you think that it solves one problem? But I guess my question is, does it raise another problem for the sector in the long run? Yeah, I think I mean, clearly that we see the concentration right now that we all have is at least in the mall sector is the department stores, the Sears, the J.C. Penneys, etc the Macy's who are consolidating. And these companies typically, even like Bontime, which is a company based here in uh, York, Pennsylvania, many of these companies are over levered and I'll say financially troubled. So when you get uh, a mainline health to open at um, uh, Exton Mall, the credit there is impeccable, right? So we're actually improving the credit quality of our tenancy by changing a lot of the off price retailers, the TJXs in the world, you know, they have much better credit than the traditional department stores. Stick hoarding goods is better than the people they're replacing. So we see it as our the quality of our cash flows is improving while the tenancy is the mix. But we're also getting a more diverse tenant mix. Even though department stores would comprise a large part of the, uh, the space, they pay very little rent. Um, so we're able to take $2 a square foot space and make it $20 a square foot space with a little capital investment. So, um, you know, we think the overall profile, it's very painful to go through the process of, of transformation, but I think the end product, I think from our perspective, you know, we tell our investors that you're, you get a higher quality cash flow and a more diverse uh, tenant mix with uh, introduction of other uses into the mall. I want to ask one too. So sure, yeah. yeah. How, today, home ownership came out, and it's kicked up to 64.1%, um, which is down under 63, I think, when the bottom one is 62.7. It's high 67. Do you guys have, are you agnostic on it? Do you have a kind of view on, is that number 67 seems kind of high? But do you, what, 
Because that's big, right? That's big. There's no apartment guys. That's not real apartment guys. Yeah, part of the part of the answer is I said something about creating 43 million in the new houses. Right. What so uh, The reality is, you know, we're, we're going to close 65 houses this year. So, so you got stuff for you guys. It's uh, <laughs> at 100 so houses. So, so, so at 100 we houses, houses we do 70 million. At 200 houses, we do. <laughs> You know, 150 million. It's like it, we don't we don't need a lot of houses, but I, I you know, clearly the home ownership. It's what we'd like to see is is uh, an increase in home ownership with proper underwriting. Obviously. Yeah, I just writ large for the industry. It's an interesting question given all the apartments have been built. And right. not there. I mean, it could be a great days for you guys, even if you're going yeah. dirty. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, the demand is very good. Prices up, so. yeah. I see people sort of um, finding that. That sector a little scary. Prices have been for rent. The apartment yeah. sector. Yeah. That that's slowing down um, significantly. It's been it's been very high. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, I'm class of '64 CNF. I'm now a real estate appraiser, commercial. Uh, a lot of the uh, shopping malls have a fair amount of empty space. Yet the King of Prussia Mall has gone in the opposite direction and expanded. Uh, how do you explain that anomaly in, other, in an industry that is otherwise having hard times? Well, I think, I mean, King of Prussia is, is unique for a lot of ways. I mean, I think that it draws from tremendous, you know, it's, it's known in the industry as, you know, one of the top malls in the country, you know, just because of its its size. I think it's probably the largest, kind of, it's the largest and it gets surpassed by somebody else. But I think the diversity of, of, of um, offerings they have, right, so they, they offer products to almost shoppers at every price point. And you know, today, not unlike what we're doing, is they're offering, if you think about on the periphery, there's so many more dining opportunities there. So they're, again, uh, bringing in other uses, which is bringing a different client base. ICSC, which is our trade organization, International Council of Shopping Centers, we did a study years ago that said if people you know dine and shop, they're more likely to make a purchase than if they just come to shop, right? So that dining is complimentary and helps you know lose you know, people have a drink or two for dinner. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I'm, 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 <laughs> but I think it's 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 true. So I think there's but King of Prussia is I think you're going to see the bigger the better malls get better and the weaker malls become obsolete. I and mean, that's what you're you're saying. And we have a couple malls that compete with King of Prussia. One in Plymouth Meeting, and again. There's very little apparel, so we, we can't compete with the offerings that King of Prussia has. So we're trying to differentiate it. So we do things like Legoland Discovery Zone. Uh, we do you know more restaurants. We do Whole Foods. Likewise, at Exxon, we're putting a Whole Foods in. We opened up a Round One, which is a bowling and entertainment concept. So we're trying to find, as a competitor of King of Prussia, find other uses that you know, we're not going to be able to compete with King of Prussia on the offerings that they have. But we're going to try to find other reasons for you know people to come to our properties. And to Bob's point, it, there was an article in the local press, I think within the past year, that was talking about the demographics and the income base of people within, I think it was like a 15 mile radius of King of Prussia, and just saying it's kind of off the charts and really being replicated. Well, from New York State, it just brings it's 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 They did. Yeah. Last time I was there, in, um, New York. in New Jersey, it, it, there were several out of state plates there. So. <laughs> Uh, I have a question for Chick. Um, I'm going to ask, would you agree that more Medicare payments are moving away from the fee for a service model and more towards a value-based payment model? And then if so, would you start divesting from your acute care facilities? Yeah, it, it's an interesting question. And, and it was really, um, I think, uh, under the Obama administration, that was really what they were suggesting was the way to try to contain health care costs on a more long-term basis. Uh, and we and, and every other hospital provider out there were and continue to really ramp up with the expectations that at some point that's going to occur. Um, you know, as you can imagine, the challenge in really trying to figure out a fair and equitable way of measuring and, and you know compensating for that is you know typically the devil in the details when you start to think okay how would we do this um, it, it kind of got postponed a little bit or at least put on the back burner as this talk about uh, you know ACA repeal and replace has been tossed around uh, it, I think it would be naive of any of us to believe that it's not going to become something that if not in the 
make sure uh, we're in our media term and the longer term we're going to have to uh, to reconcile only because as you look at the, the health care demographics and, and uh, the related financing of that, you're going to continue to have an increase in people that are going to be demanding the services and uh, you know, a relatively limited budget to be able to provide those. So there's no question there's going to be huge changes to that as we go forward. Um, and as far as the acute care business itself, if we're looking at UHS's portfolio just from an investor's perspective, not you know from a uh, you know a healthcare provider perspective, the behavioral health component is really what investors find most attractive in our uh, in our portfolio, really because it doesn't have the same pressures and dynamics, uh, you know, just from a, a revenue and expense perspective that the acute care does. Uh, acute care hospitals are, uh, you know, historically relatively low margin. They're hugely capital intensive. Uh, you know, just the amount of reinvestment that you need to make year to year is, is you know, pretty astounding. Uh, on top of that, we've um, you know typically uh, grown our acute care division by doing organic growth, meaning that in the markets we're in, we will expand the bed capacity at those facilities. But it's been a long time since we bought an acute care hospital, uh, whereas you know all the growth that we've experienced over I'd say the last 15 years or, or so, for the most part, uh, you know if it hasn't been within our acute care markets by expanding capacity, it's been on the behavioral health side. So. You know, I, I think the the um, the you know uh, uh, pressures that the acute care facilities have been facing, they will continue to face as we go forward. And I think the you know the value based uh, reimbursement that uh, you know likely will come out at some point in the future will you know certainly be an extra component to that. Chick, is the competition on the behavioral side uh, <coughs> mostly? For a profit as well, or are there um, tax exempts in that space as well? Yeah, so there, there's tax exempt. So UHS now has become uh, the number one provider in the nation on the behavioral side. Uh, so we we probably have um, you know our uh, you know roughly 300 facilities, or maybe 20 percent of the market. Um, you know, just from a pure growth perspective, again, I think the challenge that we see on the behavioral side, and continuing the growth pace that we've had, is that Many of the chains out there that had facilities we own uh, or we get bought over time. So now it's kind of one offs, two offs, three offs from not for profits or you know uh, private equity. Um, and private equity really has become probably our main competitor in acquisitions uh, because you know I think that they uh, you know and just from a pure return perspective are looking at the. Um, you know the opportunities that you created on the behavioral side, and that has become a you know a very competitive uh, industry in trying to expand. Yeah. Um, since the new uh, tax legislation was brought up, I was going to ask if uh, if any of you think the 1031s will be banned in that, and what would the industry do? Does that happen? Well, as the, the bill is structured right now, I was going to wait for a panelist to grab right. it, but uh, as the bill is structured right now, uh, 1031 for real estate survive. So it's, so it's a testament to the real estate roundtable and the NAREG's lobbying expertise. Uh, but uh, all real estate is pretty much uh, well protected in this new bill. 1031 survive. REIT's got great um, staying power legislation. So 1031s are, are disallowed for other types of property. The biggest user of 1031s other than real estate though is uh, rental cars. The leasing agency, they, they sell their big, or they exchange their big portfolios of cars. So, so. While we're on the topic of tax too, I'll just throw out one thing from the UHS perspective. So, uh, you know, when I was uh, talking about the acute care business for UHS, um, for-profit acute care hospitals are, are about 15% of the acute care hospitals in the nation. And, you know, so 85% are not-for-profit and don't pay um, income taxes or property taxes. I think one of the struggles that the for-profit acute care industry has been voicing for years is that just from a, an uncompensated care perspective from charity care or, or you know, uh, uh, caring for indigents, I believe there's not, or we believe there's not a huge difference 
uh, between a not-for-profit and a for-profit, yet the for-profits are required to pay both income taxes and property taxes, which we think creates uh, an unlevel playing field. UHS is essentially a statutory uh, income tax rate filer, so if the corporate rate really did go from 35% to 20%, it has a huge impact on UHS's cash flow and, and bottom line. So, um, you know, it is something that we're watching very closely, and the, the limitations that they're talking about putting out for uh, interest expense, we fall below that because we're a relatively low lever company, so uh, something we're keeping a close eye on. Are you selling? <laughs> you got to put some perspectives. I thought Jackie was a sales guy. Was just trying to... <laughs> All right. Okay. Okay, with questions. All right. So let's. Uh, let, oh, oh, sorry. Who was that? Oh, yes. I've got a follow up question for Chick about what you were saying earlier about uh, organic growth. <laughs> Um, so I'm actually from King of Prussia, so UHS is a pretty easy example, I think. Um, so with like an area, I mean, King of Prussia might even in itself be a market because how central it is. Um, for a market that's growing so quickly that you're already established in, um, I mean, King of Prussia, I mean, Upper Marion in itself is, there's a new elementary school, um, the new town center with all the apartments. Um, how, like what process do you go through to organically grow in that market? Yeah, and Bob had uh, mentioned when he was talking about mainline health, and uh, we, we don't have any med ser surge hospitals in, in really the northeastern part of the United States. They're pretty competitive markets, um, and what UHS's strategy was, and this goes back again 40 years, was really to try to get into areas that had projected outside growth uh, over the national average. So we really gravitated towards Florida, Texas, uh, Las Vegas is a huge market for us. Uh, we have six of our facilities in that market. We're in California. Uh, we actually uh, own 80% uh, of, of the George Washington University Hospital in D.C. Uh, that's probably, at least you know, in this area, our closest. Um, and that partnership actually has worked out very well for uh, you know, hopefully both things. And, and that, that really stems from, uh, this goes back, I think, to the early 90s, where the university had a, a, a uh, you know a physical plant that they wanted to upgrade. They owned 100 percent of the old GW uh, University Hospital. They wanted to upgrade it, but they didn't want to put out the capital to do so. So they were entertaining bids for capital partners and and you know uh, um, partners to, to really not only finance and construct a new hospital, but then be put you know the managing partner going forward, uh, which we did, and and that's been very successful. So I, I think that when, when I was referring to organic growth, it, it, it's been interesting, and I think that it kind of goes back to the other question about us being more cautious <laughs> than the parasite. In the markets we're in, they tend to be ones that had outsized growth over time, and our facilities needed to have either an additional facility somewhere close to it so that we can kind of uh, connect the services or, or network the insurance uh, contracts. Uh, or we just needed additional bed capacity in those facilities. So that's really what I, I would say over the last 15 years our growth has been on the acute side. If we're there, we generally are doing okay and we continue to expand it, but you know, there hasn't been at least a deal that we've found to our liking to win to markets that we haven't been in for years. Okay. Oh, yes. I have one for Mr. Smith. Uh, I was just wondering if I could get your take on. Not the point of Jim. <laughs> well, it was in terms of Jim James. I yeah, the cross match. So, Jim. Uh, so, Jim. I was wondering if I could get your take on. I was a lot worse than that, yeah. <laughs> uh, I was hoping to get your take on the overall resilience of student housing as a product type with the you know oncoming of and the adoption of electronic education, uh, online education, and the overall skimming down of the physical universities, university model across the country? Sure. Uh, well, there's a couple of different things. There's kind of a couple of different dynamics at work there. One is that there are fewer kids of high school, grade school and high school age now. So it's just a natural evolution of the, the, uh, the population. The baby boomers were born between 45 and 64. 64. The, the major uptick in the population, there were much fewer Gen X uh, kids born you know, during that period of time. The baby boomers then moved on and had kids, so we you know, became you know, the millennials, which you know, in the industry we call the echo boomers. And you know, those, those, you know, that group is now kind of moving out, and there's now the children of the Gen X kids 
fewer parents, therefore fewer kids. So there's definitely fewer kids coming into college right now. The college are kind of scrambling to adapt to that a little bit. But there's two different things that, two different things are kind of making up for that a little bit. One is that a higher percentage of high school graduates are going to college every year. And there's a larger influx of international students coming in now that you know really are kind of filling that gap. And that's that works, you know, well in a lot of different ways. The international kids are not just looking for financial aid, so they're paying full price, which is, you know, that works it's a good revenue model for the schools and, and for us as well. But um, you know, so between that and the, the electronic schooling, I think that you know we're guys that we're kind of fill back filling with one and students on that. So that both those facts are going to kind of you know mitigate against that thing. Schools definitely need to slim down a little bit. You know, they need to make sure that they're they're understanding. You know, there there are fewer kids out there, so they're competing for a smaller market. But you know, I think some schools will, will kind of feel the uh, the effects of that. But I think a school like Villanova, you know, some of the state schools in the area, some you know, the, the larger the better. Uh, organized and better run private schools will survive this. Some of the ones, you know, will have to really kind of be think scaling things back. But in the end, kids still want to have the social experience of going to college. You know, so there's, there's still going to be plenty of kids out there doing this. Um, you know, the industry needs to be aware of that. You know, you need to make sure that we're, we're hitting the right markets. You know, some of these markets are getting overbuilt now. You know, if we, get, we won't build or buy something in Minneapolis, you know, where the University of Minnesota is. Um, we won't buy something in Fayetteville, Arkansas. You know, doesn't sound like a real hot market for you know normal real estate, but for student housing, that that's a majorly overbuilt market. Um, you know, University of Arkansas obviously is a big school, but there's only so many kids there. But some things change. Um, you know, we actually were, I would have told you three years ago we wouldn't have bought a, school, a, a property in College Station, Texas. Uh, with the phone we just raised, we've actually bought three of them because Texas A&M changed their enrollment process, uh, situation. So you know, we're going to increase our enrollment by 60% over the next decade. So College Station went from being overbuilt, underbuilt, almost overnight. So a lot of it's dynamics, you know, a lot of it's market dynamics, you get to really stay on top of those things. But um, what you're saying is absolutely something that the industry needs to be sort of, you know, aware of and keep taking into consideration and be very flexible you know, in the markets you're in. Okay, just in the interest of time, uh, we want to try to finish in maybe 20 minutes or so to give all of our students and guests a chance to network with you guys. So I'm going to go down a path real quick. Those of you that are in the class, you knew that we followed the path of first talking about sources of capital, then talking about operations, then coming soon, financial statements. Uh, so this will be, that part of the conversation will be a great preview for the next couple of classes and so take good notes. But let's start just talking about sources of capital. Maybe we can just touch on uh, the, the public markets, uh, a, a private owner operator, where they're going to, and then Jackie from the private equity real estate funds, what's the market like there in terms of sources of capital? So our, our publicly traded reach, you guys want to one by one start talking, or what's the market like out there? Sure. I mean, the, the beauty of being a public company is you can actually raise capital if you're an established company in a matter of days, right? You decide you're going to do an offering. You bring, uh, whether it's a uh, you know, common fallen offering, debt offering. You know, we did a couple of preferred stock offerings this year where you basically open up a data room for uh, underwriters to do due diligence. You spend about a week doing that. Uh, you know, you organize uh, your marketing, which in, in many cases is one day. And you know, from soup to nuts, within 30 days, you can actually raise hundreds of millions of dollars you know, at our size. And certainly, if you're a larger company, billions of dollars in a relatively short period of time. I think right now, uh, uh, the public markets are extremely, aside from the, the aspect of kind of being tied to the quarterly reporting cycle, which certainly has its downside, but from a capital accessibility standpoint, uh, you know, just to give you some statistics, you know, um, the IPO market um, at the last, I guess, four years has been 18 new REITs that have been formed. Unlike in prior years, you talk about, you know, people like represent up on this panel, you have uh, billboard REITs, you have farmland REITs, you have single family home REITs. All these new companies are taking advantage of the REIT structure to access the public markets in a way that didn't exist years ago. But, you know, so 18 companies in the last four years, you know, raised about $9 billion in the total equity market cap of all the public REITs is probably close to a trillion dollars. So certainly capital's out there, very accessible, very easy to raise. Um, and you know, it's a, what's the single best thing about being a public company is how quickly you can raise capital and deploy it. 100% agree. It's, it's 
we'll, we'll talk later, perhaps if we have time, about about all of the costs to be able to do that, uh, about being a public company. But but uh, I, I would say the time frame is even shorter. If you have all of your filings in order and, and you're a large established uh, issuer in the public markets, we could issue $500 million of debt by the end of the week if we want to. Um, so it's incredibly uh, efficient to raise capital. On the private side, um, well, it's not, it's not nearly as easy as what you're saying, but I will tell you that if the last eight or nine years, I would get up in the morning and thank God for the help of my family and my loved ones, and then thank God for pretty much getting back in their health. <laughs> because especially you know, in the multifamily industry, you know, well, where there's a major liquidity problem with the rest of the, the, rest of the real estate markets, you know, retail, you guys obviously have some major problems, you know, raising debt for retail office buildings, things like that. Freddie Mac and Penny makes taking business. And that, that's why for a long time multifamily became the dark <coughs> industry. You know, it's been hot for the last eight years. It's, you know, and although it is starting to slow down a little bit, as you were saying, Jackie, there's still actually more um, interesting enough, there's actually still more of a demand than there is supply on the on the uh, apartments are apartment side. Um, but the biggest thing is being able to go to, to like Freddie and Fannie, and obviously we keep releasing for all the banks in the area for, for obvious reasons. So our construction financing is usually with local banks, but if the local banks know that we have a Freddie and Fannie uh, takeout for them, that they're, they're much more willing to give us uh, the construction financing on good terms. And you know, as I said, we've really cultivated the Freddie and Fannie uh, relationship over the years, and obviously some of the banks are also involved in getting us those deals with Freddie and Fannie, but uh, it makes you know, all the difference in the world because you have you know, it's guaranteed execution. You know, you, you know what they're looking for in terms of their underwriting, and you know they're going to show up at the closing table with a check. So it makes yeah, a huge difference for us. So, you know, we've reduced the amount of leverage we do. You know, we're, we're not as low leverage as the REITs are, but we're, you know, we used to be 70, 80% leverage. Now we're down down, you know, 55, 60% leverage in a lot of cases because, you know, the banks have gotten tougher with those sort of things, and the Freddie's gotten tougher as well. So you, you want to make sure that you have enough equ equity dollars in there and the banks will find it attractive. And we're raising equity dollars at the same time. So you know, the equity investors also want to make sure that they're putting their money out and getting a return on that also. You're not just looking at debt and giving them all the risk and not giving up the return. Generally, what are your sources of equity? The fund that we raised recently, uh, we generally it's uh, a lot of people that have a state and education market. It's, you know, uh, state, Educating, education pensions, school endowments, those sort of uh, places like that. But you know, besides that, we have, you know, we do a lot of organic work as well. So we fund a lot of things internally on our cash flow. Jackie, what do you see in real estate funds? Uh, I do see the um, the equity raise to be a little bit a little bit tougher um, with the institutionals. That um, what um, I see our clients finding is not really um, a loyalty. It's it's what need they have for their mix at the time for for their risk, and they might be available for one fund, but they might not be available for the next fund. And you, they look a lot to the performance. They look heavy onto the reporting. A lot of due diligence on on that. So it's a struggle to get that big institutional client in. Um, we see a lot of money being available through the investment banks, investment managers, financial, um, but that means you've got to have a lot of reporting. But they'll, they'll be raising money easily that funnels in through um, some of the investment banks to, to the private equity and the feeder fund. Um, but there's a lot of demands that come with getting that money. Um, and there's a lot of due diligence that's done with the fund for that. Um, the more private developer, the single deals, I see a lot of family office, and I see some foreign family offices um, funding um, single deals in, in the US. Generally, what, what's the size of the funds that are being created now in your world? I'm seeing small, <coughs> mostly. And I know there's some big funds out there, but I'm seeing a lot of 200 million, 300 million max, and they want to get the the, uh, the fund invested in the same cycle, and and so they they need it to be smaller so they can get invested. And, and the period of time from announcing the fund to it getting completed, your raising completed, what, what time period? Is that, that seems to to. Um, 
be narrowing, but always asking for extensions. <laughs> so, um, uh, two years. Be, yeah, two years on you know, max. And then they want to invest a little faster, investment here and being, being pushed a little tighter. But uh, really kind of losing patience for um, funds extending for a longer time. That again, they want that to try to catch the wave on, on a single cycle, one way or the other, um, and get the money deployed. And we're seeing it harder for the funds to deploy with the promised returns. So lots of times they'll have the capital raised and trying to find the deals. And I think that was my point really on the um, multifamily. It's just with the prices going up, it's been harder for them to get the returns that, that they want. So, so. Oh, well, how, how, how long have we been that? <laughs> trying, trying to deploy our, uh, the bar fund has been very difficult. Right. Just trying to get the, you know, we, we could have burned through that money in, in six months if we wanted to. But the prices but are exactly, high. Yeah. Exactly right. So good comparison of the two models. The funds are going to spend 18 months to two years to raise that 200 million. They'll bolt it on the side, on the side of 70% leverage, and then over an extenuated period of time, they'll acquire their their portfolio. The publicly traded REITs will snap their fingers and raise 50 million to 200 million on either a debt public debt offering or a uh, equity offering. Okay. I think on the single deals. Um, that's why the family offices kind of like to do a single deal. They'll have a little bit of control with that, um, and that can happen a little faster. Yeah, so uh, just to cover quickly on the UHS, UHT side. So UHT, um, the timing is similar to what Bob talked about with, um, you know, being able to raise equity financing. Uh, what we uh, historically have done at UHT, which is a, a pretty conservative growth REIT, uh, we have been over our history, and what we've really done there is really look first to finance uh, acquisitions through non-recourse financing that's secured by the property that we're buying. So that's usually our first go-to. Uh, we have a, a revolver, which we can have if we need to, uh, but in the need for the capital side, because you know REITs obviously pay out such a large dividend, uh, you know, coupled with the fact that it's somewhat diluted to the price when you do a big bang equity issuance, we've come up with this um, at-the-market equity issuance program that we've utilized over the last five to 10 years, which basically gives you the capacity to uh, issue on a daily basis once you go through all the due diligence and, and underwriter, underwriter clearance and SEC filings associated with that. Uh, but just allows you to, uh, to um, issue equity, uh, you know, just to a certain day. If you like the price, you set the limit, you issue 10 or 20 or 30,000 that day, and then the next day you rethink it. And that way we're only bringing equity into whatever degree we have a use for it because uh, it does come with, a, you know, a more expensive cost generally than debt does given the dividend uh, level. The UHS side, um, we, you know, we've been fortunate enough that it, we have relatively strong cash flow. So UHS typically, in the just round numbers, our our free cash flow, or actually our uh, cash by operate from operations, is about a billion a year uh, because it is a very capital intensive business. Because we do reinvest organically, we spend about half of that back in our existing facilities. So that of the 500 million that's left, uh, we generally look to pay down debt. Uh, and or buy back our shares. It's been years and years and years since UHS has had to go to the equity markets. Uh, again, with the thought being that that comes at a greater cost than debt, and we're able to really get uh, private debt uh, financing uh, through banks and, and other institutions quickly, um, and to the degree then that we ever do an acquisition that requires a huge amount of capital at one time, then we would consider doing you know, a, a public debt offering first, and then, um, you know, if it's something that's uh, almost gigantic by today's measures, then we would consider issuing equity, but that's by far the last resort. And to, if you could just stay on that path, so you, you've gone out and gotten a new debt or equity to fund an acquisition, so just from a, a due diligence point of view, um, either the property or from a financial reporting point of view. Can you walk everyone through some of the things that you would be considering or doing in terms of buying a house and, or buying a property? We're all familiar with the little bit of due diligence we do on a house, which is the commercial property is a lot different. Yep. 
Um, so, it, you know, if we're talking on the hospital side, and, and I think we covered, you know, much on the acute care side about what we would look at and how we would look at that, uh, you know, there are certain markets that uh, when you have the really big mainline health and other uh, not-for-profit uh, uh, institutions that are pretty embedded in those areas, it's almost impossible to be a standalone acute care provider in markets that are this entrenched now. So, uh, you know, that's kind of led us to believe that it's either, you know, new markets where you don't necessarily have that dynamic or uh, just a, um, uh, you know, uh, an expansion of existing markets that we're in that uh, our facilities have a nice market share. Um, on the UHT side, um, you know, I, I think we look for many of the demographics that are similar to what UH, UHS does. I think we, we really like uh, medical office buildings are probably our favorite uh, as far as what we've done over the last 10 years. And we typically go into areas that, uh, you know, we hope uh, have not only a strong demand currently, but that will see uh, growth that maybe is a little bit beyond what the national average is. Um, and, uh, you know, then it's really kind of just getting into the property specific dynamics that are associated with that. I think with medical office buildings, probably the first uh, thing you look at is whether or not it's on a hospital campus or not, uh, and what types of, you know, generally they come with land leases because the hospital, uh, while they love to have somebody there to, you know, effectively. Uh, either construct or buy a medical office building to house services or doctors that then, uh, you know, uh, have uh, patient bases at the facilities. Um, there's also the concern 10 or 20 or 30 years from now that if they don't control the land, there's, there's a, a competitor that may come back to bite them somewhere, somewhere along the way. So, you know, that's kind of the first dynamic that we'll decide is, do you want to be on campus where you have more restricted covenants related to land leases and the things that go with that, or would you rather be off, which doesn't necessarily bring that uh, connectivity and synergies with the facilities that, you know, for the most part might have the rents being a little bit less than they might be if the physicians can just, uh, you know, walk down the hallway or, or through the parking lot to get to the facilities. Um, as far as, you know, new versus old or multi-tenant versus single tenant or 100,000 square feet or 10,000 or 20,000, 30,000 square feet, we look at everything. Uh, you know, I think that at the end of the day, unlike healthcare, where I think it is, you know, more of a, you know, longer term view and it, it encompasses different dynamics. I think on the real estate side, especially for the public REITs, you know what your dividend uh, payouts are, you, you kind of know what your capital structure is, and you're looking to do deals that are accretive to the cash flow that just help the growth in all those avenues. So, um, you know, it, it comes down to a little bit more of a mathematical exercise. Obviously, you're still trying to uh, portray what the risks are on a longer term basis or what the future might bring uh, as far as, you know, uh, demand for your property. But um, it is a little more, I think, academic process that we go through. Anything different from your end, Holmes? Anything about you saying? Well, no. So if you're looking for a piece of property, in other words, uh, you know, part of what we're looking at is uh, we've got developers and we've got, we've got builders. I mean, we're primarily a builder, and a lot of the lots that we're purchasing have already been developed. And we're, you know, they're, they're tracked in terms of the specific lots, et cetera, and the, all the zonings and approvals are in place. Uh, the, the environmental reports have already been done, the, the, uh, the uh, water tables and everything else are in shape. So yeah, we're, we're not looking to go take a piece of farmland and wait 10 years to take it through all the improvements. So that's all done before you get there. It's much more difficult time consuming and costly. Okay. All right, last topic before then we wrap it up, or so you have one last chance if you have any questions, but just switching to financial reporting now. So, so we've got situations with publicly traded entities. They're going to have a financial reporting a set of issues that are different from uh, the fund arena, the privately um, operated space. So, Tim, maybe you can lead off just some of the, the issues with uh, financial reporting and what you're dealing with on a regular basis. Sure. So, we talked, Bob got to cover the fun part about being a public company that you can raise capital really fast, but the cost that comes with that, uh, and it's really a disconnect. You think about a lot of, a lot of the REITs that exist, um, 
were, a lot of them were family businesses. A lot of them were, were formed in a very entrepreneurial way with a real estate developer who is, uh, uh, who is by stereotypically uh, a go-getter, creative, um, uh, deal person. Um, and then uh, they find that to capitalize their company, they think being in the public marketplace would be great because we can raise capital so fast that we can double, triple, quadruple the size of the company if we had access to that capital. The challenge is that to be able to do that, you need to, um, you need to check a lot of boxes. Um, from a financial reporting standpoint, um, you have uh, Sarbanes-Oxley controls, uh, you have auditors external, you have auditors internal. Uh, you need to report all of your results um, and get reviewed by the SEC and, and address comment letters. Um, and it's a lot of crossing of T's and dotting of I's. And, and as you heard all the backgrounds um, uh, of, of the panelists, it's kind of where we grew up. It's kind of where I grew up. So that part of it doesn't bother me. The problem is, as an organization, um, you're, you're really hamstrung sometimes because of all of those requirements. Uh, not only on a financial reporting stamp from from a financial reporting standpoint, but from an investor relations standpoint, we're we're all in long term businesses. Uh, we're making decisions um, in in real estate. Where oftentimes you're making a decision where you're not going to see a benefit for three, five, ten years down the road, and yet our investors, the owners of our company, are interested in how's the share price going to perform next week. Um, and so not only do we have to report our results every quarter, we need to talk about them constantly. And so a lot of our investors want to know the decisions that we're making today, um, how is that going to, how is that going to work out for, uh, uh, for results in the, in the fourth quarter or the first quarter of next year. I actually had a meeting uh, with, uh, so we have a lot of conferences that we attend. Bob and I have the pleasure of, of each going to a, 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 one of the big industry conferences next week in Dallas. But I was at a conference uh, one week in New York, and I met with this group of investors, and there was one person in there in particular who was asking, we had just had our earnings call two weeks prior, so we had told them everything we can tell them. And as a public company, we need to be really careful to, to disclose everything equal to the market. I can't tell you something that I haven't told everybody else publicly, uh, or, or I could get myself and, and, and my company into trouble. So we're at a meeting, and we had just released earnings two weeks, two weeks ago. person comes and says, how's business? I said, well, you know, it really hasn't changed in the last two weeks since we had our earnings call. I mean, self-storage is a really exciting business, and things change all the time. But in two weeks, not that much has changed. So I met with this person, had this conversation, tried to do the dance of being helpful but not getting myself in trouble. Another conference in Chicago the next week, this guy shows up again in the meeting. He goes, so how's business? I'm like, since last week? Um, but that's that's kind of the uh, the challenge of being in, the, in a public company is, is – is your investors, people who make money buying and selling your stock, are trying to find an angle, they're trying to find any little tidbit of information in a very long-term business, they're trying to find ways um, to find arbitrage or, or, or trade on short-term information. So it's a, it's a really big disconnect um, in, in the fundamentals of running the business versus um, uh, a lot of, a lot of the, gl the glamour, I think you called it, the glamour is, uh, uh, the glamour of being a public company is uh, is having a lot of investor meetings to try to manage expectations. Compare that and, and to private equity sure. sources here. Well, no, on, on the private side, obviously, the requirement to be transparent is a whole lot less. But, <laughs> you know, we don't, deal, we don't have the same kind of reporting requirements with the SEC. But our lenders want to know what, what's going on, our investors want to know what's going on. So, we're, you know, we're constantly communicating with the investors. But that less transparent situation is a little bit of a double-edged sword as well. Because you're trying to, out trying to get a deal, you're trying to do a development deal with, with a school or something like that. Um, you know, a lot of times we wind up second to the public REITs, primarily because of that. Because although we're, we have an open book philosophy and we give, give them all of our information, they still wonder, are you holding something back? Whereas the public guys can't hold something back. They just they go to get their you know, 10K and 10Qs, and they've got all the information they want to get here. We can give them all the information privately if they, they can get out of the 10K. But it's not as blessed by the SEC. So you, you kind of, you know, there's always an element of doubt in, in the investors' minds. You know, are we getting everything we should be getting? And, you know, it, it, it does kind of cut both ways on that because, you know, our, we, have, we have extensive reporting requirements. You know, we have letters and, you know, the, the, whole, the whole nine yards. But um, there's always that little bit of, of an element sitting out there where the investors are saying, you know, are you really giving me everything? And are, are, you, are the skeletons in your closet you're just not telling me? You know, there may not be. In fact, you know, we like to believe there are. But, you can't convince them of that because you can't prove a negative. So. Jackie, what about uh, 
fair value reporting. Is that uh, right. the real hornet's nest? Um, for uh, for the private, it's it's valuing uh, putting capital account statements out. Most of our clients are regulated, so they have to issue capital account statements to their investors on a quarterly basis. The timing of that um, will have questions and it, this would, it, sometimes from foreign investors to like a day after the quarter close and usually you don't have a valuation of, of 100 properties the day after the quarter closes so setting expectations despite what's in the agreements um, is part of it but also trying to do that faster and, and you have to leverage the technology as much as possible um, then investors asking for the capital account statement information in a, about five different ways. It's the same information, but each investor wants it like sort of a different way. I'm trying to, to standardize it, but you have to still make your investors happy um, and finding that, that balance. Lots of times they want real, real push lately for real data, live data, data that they can sort themselves develop their own reports themselves, which is just a little tricky and scary on the controls. So um, we haven't had anybody move that way in the real estate group at all. Um, so we've, we, we haven't presented that, but it, there's definitely a pool. We've, we've been permitting, and, and since we have the books and records, um, will let um, the, the client see that data that way, and but not released to investors yet. It's got to go for all the closing. So just a lot of demands as far down to the property and as much detail, more in a shorter time frame is what we see. One thing I was going to mention is, is um, I, I, Kind of interesting. When I was a senior in college, I remember uh, getting towards the end and, and, and having that that mixed feelings of, man, I'm really going to miss I'm really going to miss this part of my life. But the one thing that I wasn't going to miss was having to take exams, uh, especially finals, where there was so much subject matter that you really weren't sure what to study, were really weren't sure how to prepare. And so when I graduated, I was so relieved that I was done. I was done with taking exams. I was done with having to prepare. I was going to go out in the workforce, and I was going to get paid, and I was going to do a job. And here I am, 20, more than 25 years later, and every three months I have to prepare for a damn final still, because we have our earnings calls. It's and, a quiz. And, and it's, a quiz. It's, a, it's a final, because you have no idea what questions you're going to get asked. And so we have a team of folks um, that literally go through and try to anticipate questions that we might get asked at a meeting, questions that we might get asked so the one difference is I have a team to help me prepare, but um, so that's different. But when we get on the earnings call um, as a public company, we have a table full of stuff, books and spreadsheets, and, and we try to be in a position so that we, when we get asked a question, we can at least appear to intelligently answer it. Uh, but I do think it's funny how uh, the public company version of it, we don't have the ability to go and, and research and, and, and provide the reports that somebody's looking for. We really need to be prepared to uh, on the fly answer an awful lot of questions and it's um, so you if you choose this path you never really get away from having to study for finals sounds pretty glamour yeah <laughs> <laughs> right. it's a little bit better than Tim you gotta admit right but, yeah. <laughs> it's not bad. okay good with questions okay yes all right and John, I had a question for you. You mentioned that you compete a lot with the large home builders. Um, I know there's been some consolidation amongst the home builders, most recently with Lennar and uh, Kyle Landick. So I was just wondering, you know, how how are you guys as a company positioning yourself to compete, um, you know, in, in the midst of this consolidation? Uh, again, we, we really compete community by community, and we we have a, a kind of a sweet spot where we think we build a better house than, than some of the guys that can actually build it cheaper. And we have to really appeal to, to the buyers in terms of the, the, the amenities and things they want. Uh, uh, we look at that consolidation. I look at that as my exit strategy. Because <laughs> uh, we are a very small builder that I want to get to a certain size. And then, you know, make sure that Jeffrey knows that it's time to go at some point <laughs> to, to sell this sucky. Uh, so, uh, <laughs> I mean, the sucky is like, yeah, that's not a thing. But anyway, I, I think the answer is that 
different builders do do compete in a different way. Like I said, the Bryans of the world, they only buy finished lots, and they are great manufacturers, and they compete on price, and they just crank out the houses. You, know, you have to know who your competitors are. Are we going to it to evaluate a land purchase or where we think we're going to go set up shop and start a new community? We need to understand who's around us and what are they selling, what are they offering, what's the price tag, and what can we build for, what we, can we get the land for, what can we build the houses for, and is there the right margin? What you'll find, ironically enough, is most of the builders that we are competing with are public. And I kind of laid out some valuation metrics, and it's amazing, you know, 20% gross margin, 10% to the bottom line, the, the multiples of a book, the multiples of EBITDA, it's, it's consistent across the board. So it's crazy how it works that way. Howdy. Um, this is a question for Jackie, but any one of you could answer this. Um, so we recently did a presentation on the EB-5 program. And I know you said you worked with foreign investors, so I was wondering if you had any experience with the EB-5 fund, um, and if not, like if you could talk about that experience, and if not, like if any of you know if anyone like uh, how they invested with the EB-5 fund. I have a little experience with the EB-5 fund. Um, we do, we share administration with one. Um, we have a relationship with um, another administrator that does all the reporting to the to the foreign investors. Um, we develop the financials for the fund itself, and then they deliver to the foreign investors. Uh, we've um, found it it's it's challenging. What we found in the marketplace is the first time somebody does an EB five. Um, it's a, a big learning curve, um, and you really wonder whether it's worth it for, for the, the arbitrage and the, and the interest. So, but once they get into the marketplace and they're known, apparently it's supposed to, to help. Um, the, the one EB-5 fund I have, I don't know whether that advisor will do another one. So I don't know whether that's, that's and plus that's been such the immigration and what's going to happen there is, is um, a, it, people are a little bit worried about that. We've also found that they're really interested only in, you know, the properties in those key markets, or at least certain countries only want investments in New York City, only want maybe Washington D.C., maybe Orlando, and nothing else. And so, any other property they're they're concerned with, they don't understand the market. Uh, so. Uh, it, it's 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 challenging, but it's it's doable. Um, people's lives are, it, you know, their their whole future and, and the whole immigration side is a whole other aspect that's not real estate. It's it's people's lives and immigrating and um, to to the United States. It's it's kind of challenging and interesting. Um, but that, that's been my one experience with it. it. It has been successful so far. Everyone got approved. Um, and I think there's still three more years that, that the investment has to, to stay outstanding and that it can be clear. Hi, my name's Kat. I'm a graduate of 2016 from BSB at County of Finance. And I apologize I missed the introductions, but I can see from the bios here that most of you did start in public accounting, which is where I am now, or if you didn't, you have your CPA license or are continuing it. So I wanted to see if anyone could talk about the different levels. So Jackie left EY as a manager, and Bob left KPMG as a partner, and then it looks like Tim was at Art Granderson as an associate. So the different levels, and you had any insight behind that? Well, from the one who left early, I was always told the smart people left early. But <laughs> I agree with that. <laughs> yeah, we agree. Yeah. Uh, I was. I, I, I actually really enjoyed. I really enjoyed public accounting. I think it, uh, it's a. Uh, it's just a wonderful place to start your career. It's effectively like getting an MBA and getting paid to do it. Um, if you. Um, if you're, if you're aggressive and, and talking to scheduling uh, folks, you can get exposed to a lot of different industries. Um, uh, you get some great exposure early in your, earlier in your career with um, financial leadership of different organizations. You can find what culture you like. 
um, organizationally, and um, I, I was just very fortunate that I was uh, right place, right time. Uh, a company that was effectively going through its IPO was a client of mine, and I was um, I was offered a role uh, early in my career that I uh, I probably wouldn't have been qualified. I would have been no more qualified five years later. So I took the opportunity. But, uh, uh, it's a great place to start your career. You made a great choice. I'll agree with that. I came out of college, I had no idea what I wanted to do. <coughs> so I'm not sure I'm now, but, um, you know. Um, and I started with Arthur Anderson. I was there for two or three years. I became a senior. But as Tim said, you know, I, I had some, some health care clients, some manufacturing clients, some banking clients, and some real estate clients. And I just found myself gravitating more towards the real estate clients more than anything else. You know, the real estate client came up, they wanted to get a special project done or something like that. I always had my hand in volunteering for it because I just found that was really, really interesting. And, you know, as part of that, it, this was a growth, this company in particular was a you know, growth uh, company in what was called real estate syndication back in the early 80s, which, you know, tax shelters and, you know, buying and selling real estate, but more and more as a tax investment than anything else. So you also had to understand the real estate fundamentals. That became very attractive to me. And they were looking to grow. They were, they were you know, going crazy at the time. And they said, why don't you go to work for us? So I said, you know what? I, I've gotten like, I, I really could out of, out of public account, you know. We had 40 people start with us in my class, and you know, of those 40 people, I think maybe three or four made partner. You know, so there really is, you know, it's, it's a pyramid type structure. When you talk about so, you know, we knew that we were going to be, uh, you know, I was going to use them, they were going to use me kind of a thing. So it worked out really well. Your, your clients don't offer you jobs, so they end up like Bob and I. <laughs> <laughs> then the firm goes away, and then you find something else to do. Right? <laughs> If you if you can't do, you can teach, right? Yeah, that's that first right. All right. <laughs> <laughs> hey, did you hear that? <laughs> Don't let you down. Okay. Anyway, uh, uh, this is so, about Tim. Uh, so you kind of mentioned earlier how oh, he's he's got, got, yeah, it's starting to break in, like the you know the Manhattan borough. So like, can you kind of talk us through like the diligence process, like breaking into a new market, and some of the opportunities and risk factors you associated with? Know, breaking the duck with so entering a new market. Right. Yeah, sorry, I'm here very well. Um, yeah, it's a uh, uh, in our business, um, we really need a critical mass of, um, of properties to be effective. Um, because, as I mentioned in the, in the intro, um, it's seemingly a very unsophisticated business that we're in. Uh, but in fact, we are very much a, a, a retailer, and we're trying to reach out to a consumer. So. Uh, the rainmakers and the rock stars in our organization are um, uh, really smart mathematical folks who are in our revenue management and our digital marketing groups, um, because we need to we need to get customers' eyes into the top of the funnel almost always through digital means. It's, it's web presence, it's Google search, um, and we need to uh, we need to be intelligent about how we spend those dollars. And so, um, to get better search engine optimization and to get some efficiencies out of your out of your digital spend. Having some concentration of assets is important. So entering entering a market with just one asset um, takes away the advantages that we have over the overwhelming majority of the folks that we compete against. So in a market like Manhattan, to open our first store, it was a it was an awful lot of um, uh, of diligence on our perspective to try to determine how effective we could be at competing. Uh, we found there, although it was our first uh, it was our first investment in Manhattan. We had established a very strong presence in the outer boroughs, and so we determined that we would be able to uh, compete uh, effectively with that asset. And what we're finding is, is it's it's harder. It's harder for us in Manhattan than it is in the Bronx or Queens or, or Brooklyn because we don't have the scale yet. Uh, we were second location will open up in, in a year, but the kind of the magic number in our business is eight to ten stores in the market. So we have uh, another part of our business is we manage stores for others, and so what we try to do there, we do it for a fee. Um, uh, we look at markets that we're interested in investing in uh, on balance sheet. Uh, we'll first look for management opportunities so that we can learn we can learn the business running somebody else's properties. Um, and we do we do a more effective job than they can do. Uh, and we also establish a presence for our brand before we invest our own money. In there. So it's a great question, but it's a it's a big focus. Uh, my question is for Jeff. So <coughs> you mentioned how you're seeing increasing levels of investments from foreign investors. So I was just curious to see if that activity is like centralized in a few geographical regions as opposed to others, or is it kind of spread out? I, I haven't seen it that way. It's been relationships that I've seen um, that were developed, and um, I, um, one is uh, a, really a pension fund and, and, and family money that's in, t in, in timber. 
timber plant. Um, that's sort of real estate. So um, uh, also see um, it, it was uh, a, a family group really interested in student housing, and so because it's student housing, it's it's geographically all over the place in, in the U.S. Okay. Uh, I think we're at the end. We, now that we've, uh, now that John made that insult to the professor, he has to end it. But <laughs> we have 45 minutes left for you to hang out with uh, this great panel and all the food that Jess has provided for us and the, uh, the Lowell Center. So thank you again for your hospitality for hosting us. Uh, and uh, please join me in thanking our panelists here.